yeah, thank you. Um, having been uh, coerced more or less into uh, giving this talk, I thought uh, what I'll try and do, I'll uh, look at uh, some of the theoretical considerations uh, and try and attempt some sort of broader picture and uh, get us to think about <coughs> issues uh, that, might, what, that one might not necessarily think about uh, straight away when confronted with the notion of technology-enhanced standards, teaching and learning, uh, but which nevertheless, in my view anyway, uh, and from the basis of the research that I've been doing over the years, uh, can be and should be considered to be uh, very important. One of the things I thought I'll do at the very beginning, give you a quick overview of some of the issues if we have the time. Uh, we could talk about uh, in detail and at length, but clearly we don't. And I've already, what was my finishing point? Yes. And I've already been told I have to allow uh, 10 minutes for questions. So um, I've got loads of slides, and I just say a word or two about each of those. Uh, I won't be able to deal with them uh, in any detail, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, here are the sorts of issues that I think are worth exploring and thinking about and knowing about in order to be able to ensure effective whatever you might mean by that, integration of technology in language, teaching, and learning. So one of the things that's very important for me uh, at the start is trying to get some grips of why, some graph of why is it that we are now sort of 30, 40 years into uh, the uh, uh, integration of uh, new technologies in language and teaching and learning. And arguably, uh, we're still uh, very near uh, the start of really making a very effective uh, uh, go at it. And there's a number of reasons here uh, why I think uh, we have had problems uh, in relation to the effective integration of technology. and. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, research and thinking to be done around these points and issues in order to be able to do things better and do them well. Uh, from a, but that they range across a whole uh, wide spectrum. Uh, the first point that I list here, productivity paradigm and dominance of discourses around delivery. And our, our governments are quite good at that, are they not? Uh, and our managers, they want us to do this in order to save time, be more efficient and all that. But does it really save time? Any of you who've been uh, playing around uh, trying to maximize the affordances of technology uh, for language teaching and learning will have found out, no, it doesn't. Uh, if anything, it takes more time. Uh, and so long as these sorts of uh, uh, notions are being banded around everywhere, it's going to be very, very difficult to really uh, make it successful. Then there's a big problem that many of uh, people in uh, Gene's uh, latter group have around technology. They profoundly dislike any sort of fetishization of technology. Technology is something, sort of toys for the boys, so we won't go there. Yeah? That's, just, that's been a problem. And if you look uh, on the web, in the various blogs, people trying to promote the virtues of technology, they speak a language that no normal person speaks. And you don't really understand what they're going on about. So there's a list there for us, uh, ways in which we could make it more effective. Uh, arguably, policy makers and managers have unrealistic expectations that touched upon that. Software producers tend to have a solution orientation uh, have you ever dealt with software producers? <laughs> I've had the pleasure of doing that. I've had the pleasure of looking at their products. They want to have one product for a worldwide market, and it doesn't work like that. Yeah? You need situated, context-specific local solutions, and that's what works. So there's a fundamental tension there in terms of the way in which a lot of this material is being produced, and then uh, we wonder why it doesn't work. Then I think I'm borrowing uh, uh, Graham's language here, actually, and Graham, do correct me uh, if I'm wrongly attributing this. There is a sense of a perpetual obsolescence of technology. What do we mean by that? By the time you get your head around how stuff works, it's out of date. It's like it's now, yeah? and uh, your uh, systems don't support it anymore, or it's perceived to be out of date. Big problem. 
And Jean's example of TVs being taken out of the classroom is uh, one such example. Tendency of trying to find an educational problem to which to apply an existing tool. That's Diana and Lorillard's uh, big notion. So you've got all these people inventing things and then desperately looking around what to do with it now and finding a educational problem to apply them to. It ain't going to work like that. It's going to work the other way around. Yeah? What problem do we have? Let's find a device, uh, a, a way of using technology in order to solve it. Then a particular hobby horse of mine is a lack of clarity around definitional basis. Have you ever engaged with government policy on anything to do with E? <laughs> well, you know, it, it means everything and anything, and that's not helpful. That's not a good start. Yeah? Uh, if you're not clear about what you actually mean by it, because you have no basis for talking about it and uh, develop discourses uh, about it. Then there is, unfortunately, uh, a, a perception out there that technology in itself is enough, completely forgetting that exactly things like pedagogical skills are required in order to make the technology do something effective in a classroom. And I've just been involved in uh, now the second research project for Vector, where we look at ICT CP. Uh, and uh, provision isn't great, I have to say. Opportunities for people like yourselves out there in schools and other uh, contexts to learn how to use that effectively. Not very good. Then, another thing that I'm hoping to illuminate a little bit today is uh, there is numerous key knowledge components which need to be understood in order to make technology work. And I've just listed uh, some there, there is, there's loads as we will see. First of all, foreign language pedagogy in itself is a specialized um, aspect uh, and field of inquiry uh, that one really needs to be uh, acquainted with in order to be able to see how technology fits and can fit in. Then you need to know about technology and its affordances in order to bring those two things together. Uh, you ought to have had a look at second language learning and foreign language learning research. If you, for example, want to bring uh, technology to bear on the development of writing skills in your learning, you need to know a little bit about what the research on writing actually tells about processes around writing in order to be able to understand how technology can be effectively uh, brought to bear on that. And then in relation to uh, the pedagogical dimension, as we know uh, from uh, Lee Schulman and colleagues, uh, pedagogical content knowledge is a very complex field. And now, with technology being thrown into the mix, uh, it's becoming more difficult even still. And Yarek at the back there, uh, one of my uh, students has been working on that uh, for some time now. And if you're interested in this, he's the man to talk to. Uh, he knows all about it. Uh, then, there's a, a lack of embeddedness of technology, enhanced practices in foreign language teacher education and development. Have you, when you, have you enjoyed uh, any training at all, firstly, uh, in, in relation to, to your role uh, in higher education? That's not often the case. And then if so, have you enjoyed any instruction in, in relation to technology? Uh, probably uh, very little. And then teacher perceptions and dispositions and the importance of leadership. i come back to those in a second. Um, it's just uh, a domain map that we're putting together for a current uh, project. But what we are finding is certainly from the literature that these sorts of things <coughs> are very, very important. We're just feeling disempowered because they don't understand technology, they don't understand the discourses. Uh, they think uh, it impacts negatively on their relationship uh, with learners in the classroom, taking power away from them, taking expertise away from them. So you can have a teacher who's an expert pedagogue but throw technology in, in, in the mix. They are not uh, expert any longer, and that's usually friendly. And also, uh, how people use media uh, in, in their uh, everyday lives, that's, that, that's very important. And then, just in, in, in relation to leadership, uh, that's a very, very uh, important issue. And here's some uh, research that's just come out by a colleague, uh, by a colleague at the Institute of the Local Knowledge Lab, uh, who's looked at uh, leadership styles in, in, in relation to making ICT work. 
Now think about your own context, and I fear many of you will find that it's either this or that uh, type of leadership that you're enjoying. And uh, what research suggests is neither this nor that are particularly effective in order to bring about uh, effective technologies. Yeah? It's these sorts of leadership skills. So one of the implications that research is throwing out is saying, okay, what we actually need to do is provide uh, development opportunities for leaders uh, to become more aware of these sorts of things in order to be able to lead uh, ICT implementation more effectively. So, shall we all pack up and go home now? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously not. So we're committed to this and uh, we want to work through these issues. And one of the main things I'm going to say to you is in order to be able to, 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 to implement ICT effectively, we need to spend some time thinking about these issues and we need to go to relevant research that helps us understand these issues, but just walking away is clearly not the uh, response. And one particular uh, problem, and you can read out from that uh, later on, I'm not going to talk about it at length, is I think a, a certain problem that education has uh, around uh, acculturation and uh, moving learners on. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we've got a lot of uh, pressure on us always uh, around the transmission of knowledge. And what I'll say later on is the technologies that we are currently uh, seeing uh, evolving, they don't work on the basis of transmission of knowledge. They operate on a very, very different parallel. So at one level, we need to think about our educational aims and our learning objectives uh, for, for teaching and learning in order to stand any real chance of making technology work for us. Because if we've got objectives and aims that sit ill at ease with the affordances of technology, what uh, a real uh, um, chance is there for us to, to, to uh, really uh, make a go of it? And the argument being, of course, that uh, this sort of uh, tension is being brought into sharper focus by new technologies, which are based on uh, often creativity, innovation, knowledge, construction, knowledge, sharing, and so on. Okay. Then I wanted to share this with you. To just, uh, uh, Jean's attempted one way of uh, charting the history of computer assisted language learning. I just found this particular graph uh, from a report by uh, some sort of very big uh, science organization in the States. I think Roy P. was one of the lead authors. If you have a Roy P., if not, you should have. Uh, uh, Stanford, uh, uh, California. Um, very, very uh, important a person in that sort of field, uh, basically saying that what we can see here is an increase in complexity of mediation. So, and uh, Gunta, if there's anything that I say you profoundly disagree with, shout out, which are the leading semiotician here, and it's always very difficult to talk about these sorts of things with uh, um, people in the room who know much better than you. So, uh, <laughs> So one of the things, uh, therefore, uh, technology is good at is mediation. And, the, and that, I think, is a lesson that, that we ought to learn for our language learning and teaching purposes. The other question that's already been raised this morning is around what do we really mean by language? And I'm sure Gunther is going to pick up on that as well. And if we want to use a technology effectively, one of the uh, uh, hypotheses that I want to uh, posit uh, this morning is uh, to say, well, then we need to really think about uh, what sort of, uh, what do we mean by language? And uh, do we need to start to redefine uh, a language in order to give technology a chance uh, to be effective? We've already heard the term uh, multimodality mentioned. But uh, here they basically say, and uh, this is my, I just, uh, because you won't be able to read this, I added it again here on the right. We can see that technologies have over the years uh, started to do, or enabled us to do different sorts of things. And at this particular point, we are at the point where we have a cyber infrastructure mediated uh, position. 
And uh, in order to make that work effectively, we need to do one thing, or for many, for example, we need to take seriously the technology use in everyday life of our learners. Unless we do that, we might as well not bother. So, all I'm doing here is basically throwing up a few questions. I let you worry about what to do with them. Yeah? Um, I'm not, I haven't got all the answers. I'm just uh, asking a few questions. Um, and this is something more traditional that you might have come aware of, um, that might have come uh, across already. Uh, a clusters of application, courseware, micro worlds, hypertexts, simulations, modeling, collaborative learning environments. These might have been the sorts of things that we might have at our disposal through our employers, through their infrastructure. Uh, but we need to be aware that if that's what we have first, we have to make choices here, which of those, because we probably can't do all of them. And each of those will do different things well, and others not so well. So in order to be able to talk about effectiveness, uh, I saw one person in relation to Gene's talk, I think, uh, I was nosy looking at their notes and they said their key question uh, you know, was around effectiveness and, and efficiency. efficiency right? That's always a, a, a big question. Uh, but we can't, for example, uh, expect micro worlds to uh, do certain things whilst we can expect it uh, to do others. And just to underline the complexity of it all, it's just I played around with this this morning, just very briefly. I thought, how can a cloud uh, here of uh, the tags that I use on Delicious to bookmark things? Yeah? So there's nothing scientific about it. It's hugely personal. But just uh, for you to, to get a, a quick reminder about how complex this whole area really is. And when we talk about technology enhanced language teaching and learning, uh, we could mean be meaning all these sorts of things, and uh, they're all uh, very, very uh, different and all have their challenges, um, and so forth. Then, I would argue that in addition to knowing what technologies there are, which was the previous slide, this slide is talking about we need to have a sense of what we mean by learning. And uh, Gunther and I, for example, have had long and protracted conversations of what we mean by learning, and we don't always agree, and there is loads of different positions. But at the very least, we sat down and we asked ourselves the question, and I'm just putting up here as an example, not as any sort of uh, definite uh, type of pronouncement, one way in which learning might be thought of. So if you want to think about that learning bit of technology-enhanced language learning, yeah? What do you mean by it? And if you mean this sort of thing, for example, interaction with others, interaction with oneself, confrontation between internal and external dialogue, interaction between the individuals and others within the learning, training, and social environment. You have to look for a, a type of technology use and types of applications that do that sort of thing. If you, by learning, mean you know, sitting in rows like we're doing now and have somebody talk at you, then obviously you have different sorts of technologies, not death by PowerPoint, yeah? Although we know that it's not effective at all, but that's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, my invitation to you is, have you ever thought about exactly what you mean by learning? I'm not going to say yes or no, so just ask yourself the question and then try and answer it for yourself. Okay, and since um, I'm working in the field of uh, uh, mobile uh, learning, I just uh, thought clearly one aspect of technology are devices. Yeah? And uh, one of the things one, one ought to uh, ask oneself about those devices is what their uh, particular characteristics and affordances are. So if you want to use mobile technologies uh, in the language classroom, my argument would be, would be is that by understanding that one particular characteristic of mobile devices is personal ownership, you're more likely to be more effective, whatever it is you do with them, if 
you're using the devices that are owned by the learners rather than devices that belong to the school and you give to them in two minutes to play around with. Yeah? But that's just an illustration yeah? that uh, these sorts of things need to be thought about. Portability, if you think about portability, mobile devices having that as one of their great characteristics. So having people sat in classrooms with devices to look at rather than books are the affordances of these devices, namely portability, really uh, being maximized? How can I create and mold and uh, uh, think of my teaching and learning uh, context and experience to harness that particular uh, characteristic? Uh, and, 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 and so forth. So I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to talk about it in any detail. We can have time. Okay. I don't know why this is. I'm using a Mac, and I've not worked out yet how to make these uh, bullet things disappear. Uh, coming on. If anybody knows. <laughs> um, one of the things that clearly is, if you want to do mobile learning effectively, you need to understand the bigger picture, the broader context. And here is some uh, points about uh, these broader contexts, particularly here in relation to fluidity, provisionality, and instability. And unless your pedagogical uh, disposition is not prepared to take into account these very, very significant uh, implications of using that technology, please don't start using them because it's going to end in chaos. You know? It's going to make you unhappy and it's going to make the learners unhappy. <laughs> leads to changes in authority. If you've got a problem with that from the pedagogy, in terms of your pedagogical uh, self-belief, then don't do it. So we have another slide. Um, do you recognize yourself there as a teacher? <laughs> <laughs> A very interesting work by a colleague uh, down at King's uh, a few years ago uh, shows very effectively with one image how complicated and complex it actually is to pretend to be an effective uh, uh, language, in, this, in our particular case, a language teacher uh, using technologies. Because in order to do it effectively, as Graham will know, and uh, we'll introduce him uh, in a minute, and then he's very active in all those sorts of domains. Um, you have uh, a lot of things uh, to learn and lots of opportunities to learn uh, about things like blogs, wikis, everything like this, and, and through and with them uh, from others. And if one of the things I'm simply saying here is awfully complicated and complex uh, to be an effective uh, it sounds as if I'm wanting to put you off. Not, not at all. Yeah? It's not at all what I'm trying to do. Then, pedagogical content knowledge. We talked about some theoretical, that's at least what my uh, title predicted uh, I was going to do. Yeah? We talked about some theoretical as well. One of the things you ought to know about in order to be able to use technology effectively is about teaching and uh, Lee Schulman, who we mentioned earlier, has talked about pedagogical content knowledge. And uh, he uh, said that, well, uh, you need to have uh, knowledge of your environmental context, knowledge of the subject area, knowledge of your students, uh, pedagogical knowledge, and all of that. And it, this is debatable. Yeah? That's just one model that's been around for 20 odd years and has been uh, cited time and time again and has proven to be fairly uh, useful as a starting point for talking. And then technology comes along, and Mishra and Kola are saying, okay, now you don't just have content knowledge, pedagogical knowledge, but you also have to think about technological knowledge. Uh, in other words, the most effective ways of harnessing your pedagogical knowledge in order to make learners understand content knowledge. And that's one model, and then obviously, uh, the researchers uh, need uh, to disagree with each other uh, in order to stay in business. Uh, you get other people to come along and uh, take these ideas and, 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 and modify them. So that's another way of, of thinking about it. 
you know, ICT content, context, load, payload, and so forth. The details here don't matter. Yeah? It's the overall uh, message that I would like you to take away around. It actually be quite difficult <coughs> from a theoretical perspective uh, to conceptualize uh, this, this whole issue. There's a lot of uh, useful research. <coughs> and then, of course, uh, some uh, research that uh, dates back to 2004 by Margaret Cox and Mary Webb, also at Kings. Uh, what do teachers need to understand and know in order to be able to use ICT uh, resources uh, and, and, and concepts uh, effectively? And here's a range of issues. One particular problem, for example, is here. Teachers need confidence in using a range of ICT resources, which can only be achieved through frequent practice. But if you've got a setup where you've got a computer room and you've got to spend an hour making sure that you cook the stuff, then we get in there. You don't know what particular configuration is on the computers, what the last person has done uh, to make sure it doesn't work, and all these sorts of things. Um, uh, the confidence uh, is 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 a uh, very very uh, difficult uh, thing to uh, actually have. Changes to the nature and configuration. Oh, we talked about the some distance later. Okay, mobile learning. I did say my abstract. I talked a little bit about it, so I will. <coughs> Our theory that we've been working on suggests that in order to be able to analyze and uh, practice uh, mobile learning effectively, you need to understand uh, mobile learning in terms of the sociocultural uh, ecology, where you've got structures, agency, and cultural practices interacting with each other. Mm -hmm. and it was interesting to hear Jean talk about agency. That's very important in our way of thinking about it as well. So you need to know about the structures, speed, the techno I've actually got some slides about that. Yeah, let's start with agency. Yeah? So if we want to use this stuff effectively, we need to take young people seriously as agents in learning. And we need to realize and recognize that they display what we call a new habitus of learning, in which they constantly see their life world strength, both, both as a challenge, as an environment, and a potential resource for learning. Their expertise is individually appropriate in relation to personal definitions of relevance, and the world has become the curriculum. So these are huge uh, implications uh, for uh, our approaches to content, for example, in relation to language teaching and learning. How do we get hold of uh, the learners' life worlds and the practices learners have adopted with those technologies in their life worlds? How do we deal? with this notion of individually appropriated and uh, personal definitions of relevance. If you got, if you work in school, a national curriculum, or if you go work in higher education, uh, some uh, locally uh, defined curriculum. Uh, government is trying hard to make the notion of personalized learning work. Um, it's, it, it's not easy to do. And how, we bring, how do we bring the world outside the classroom and the learning that takes place outside the classroom into the classroom? And if I don't know whether there are any of you iPhone users and have any of you played around with the applications on the iPhone, there's actually lots of, of, of them uh, with reference to language learning there. Then there's <coughs> cultural practices that young people develop around the use I've already mentioned, and then there's the structures that govern uh, understand those. Another thing that obviously has a bearing on um, the effective use of technology in language teaching and learning is what particular paradigm of language we uh, subscribe to. And in the literature, uh, and I'm going to probably argue this is all basically artificial and all that, but uh, this is a tax on me and let's do this because it does exist. Uh, people are talking about structural perspectives, cognitive perspectives, and so on social interactions and the argument therefore is you need to be clear what where you stand what perspective you have on language and that will have to determine or certainly influence the way you think about technology bringing about 
uh, these 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 sorts of things. You know, that Jean was talking about fluency being uh, very important. Well, not all of these models have fluency as one of their core components. Yeah? So, point uh, there to think about. And then, of course, my particular hobby horse always is that uh, we talk about language and we don't talk about culture enough. And we don't have a very good understanding, uh, I would argue, about uh, culture acquisition and culture learning. Of course, it's certainly not as good as uh, in terms of language learning. Um, and uh, we ought to ask ourselves some questions about uh, that too. How do we think language uh, culture learning takes place? What are the issues? And therefore, what can technology do for us? So here is one, just an example. Yeah? She was already mentioned today, Carol Chappelle, uh, way back in 98. Uh, she uh, put forward this particular uh, description of the second language acquisition process. Okay? Let's assume for a moment we went along with that, and uh, let's assume that I'm the pinned out thinking. So uh, then you have to study, OK, where in the process are we? Around input. Well, if I want to focus on input, then can technology can do certain things. If you want, say, you're interested in output, then you want to look at different sorts of technologies doing different things. So basic message here is one size doesn't fit all. Yeah? For this, you need to be very clear at what stage in the learning process you are, what your particular objective is, and choose your technology accordingly. And all this thing I mentioned earlier about uh, the, the being driven by technology won't work because it doesn't take into account this sort of then another place you could go to find out about, okay, what does second language acquisition research uh, tell us? Uh, and uh, and Long, for example, have put forward uh, these methodological principles which they derived from their research. So they say methodological principle one, MP1, is use task, not text, as the unit of analysis, and therefore unit of teaching and analysis. So if you believe in that, then you will use technology in a very particular way. You will look for technologies to do certain things. So you have to think about uh, this stuff. And then, of course, there's a big thing about digital media. There. But, but since Gunther is talking about the future of English anyway, I'm going to leave that aside. Uh, basically, just to say, what do we mean uh, by language? Then, of course, you need to think about the characteristics and the potential of technology. And the sorts of things that in my work uh, I've tended uh, to do as a okay. The sorts of things that can do well is uh, offer flexibility, offer modality, interactivity, non-linearity. Uh, they're distributed in nature. Uh, they uh, offer authenticity, uh, communicative potential, and uh, virtuality. And most recently, we see a very distinctive trend towards convergence of, of, of these sorts of things. Yeah? And then we could go on and on and on, um, talking in detail what these things mean. But since we haven't got the time, and I just want to throw out a few questions anyway, just think about affordances. I know my colleague Martin Oliver at the Institute uh, doesn't necessarily uh, like the word. I do. I think it has uh, merit. Uh, think about the affordances and uh, use that to inform the plan. Then, what else do we need to do? We need to think about the learners. What's, what, what's their uh, problems and potential issues? And we've done quite a bit of research with our master's level students uh, using uh, mixed mode uh, computer media communication based courses. And uh, uh, what we found is that newness is a very important issue for them, even if they've already been uh, distance or mixed mode uh, technology enabled language learner before. It's not Newness is not something that is there at the beginning and then goes away. It stays with learners in different ways, uh, differently. And these are the sorts of problems they have. <coughs> How do you manage work life and uh, learning with technology? That's a big uh, stumbling block for them. Uh, and uh, the uh, effectiveness of technology use uh, the, in, in terms, if you wanted to measure it in terms of student outcome, related a lot uh, to the effectiveness uh, that students develop in actually managing these complex uh, things um, for themselves. And 
as a course team, we didn't help them with that at all. We just left them on their own. Uh, that was clearly not such a good thing to do. And, and others, yeah, just uh, all here uh, getting used to e-learning. We came up with this particular model where we said, okay, there is these um, bipolar uh, parameters, uh, if, if you like, and at any one time, in any one place in relation to any one task, a learner might be here in terms of vulnerability, here in terms of no feeling of incompetence, here in terms of informality, and here in terms of newness. And that changes all the time according to context <coughs> and task. Uh, but uh, unless you are aware of these sorts of uh, uh, features, uh, you're not going to be able to allow the, student, the, the learners to be effective users of this technology. Then, I know we've got two more minutes maybe, yeah? Uh, community of inquiry. Teaching online is very different to teaching face to face. And there's various different sorts of models out there. I just picked up one that's very popular, well uh, cited in the literature. I'm sure you've come across it, Garrison and Anderson, talking about the community of inquiry and talking about the importance of getting the social presence right, the cognitive presence right, as well as the teaching <coughs> presence right. And if you go to their website, they've got a website of community of inquiry, you can drill down into all of these areas in great detail. But point being, don't just assume that face-to-face -face pedagogical approaches will work in a mixed mode or online environment. They won't. And uh, in our work, for example, we devised these four design principles for computer-mediated communication, uh, which we, around which we develop pedagogical templates in order to work with our students narrative principle, discursive principle, argumentation principle, and the intercultural principle. And if you want to know more about that, I can uh, tell you where we've written that up so you can go. Uh, then assessment uh, is another thing that uh, is very different. I think, Jean, you mentioned that, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so um, again, if we have the time, I can tell you a lot about that, but we don't. But I want to just share this with you. In our work in a GIST funded project that we did last year, we were asked to scope a vision for formative peer assessment for the higher education uh, sector. Uh, let me just assure you we didn't choose that title. Yeah? Uh, but one of the things we did find was that these are the sorts of things that technology can do reasonably well uh, in, in, in relation to assessment. And the real question is, are they uh, any uh, use to us in our particular uh, situation? And we've got, if you're interested, we've developed case studies on our website in relation to those. And we've got some articles coming out on that already. But uh, one thing, for example, to follow on from Gene and to link through to Gunter uh, this evening is around representation. Having these sorts of technologies allowing us to capture digital artifacts from students that are different to just uh, written text uh, enables us to make very different sorts of judgments about their uh, communicative uh, abilities and, and, and competence than uh, has traditionally been the case. And then, I'm not going to go into this now because I've run out of time, but what I was going to do the other thing you have to think about is, okay, am I looking at a particular skill set now that I want to be teaching, and what has technology got to offer for me? And if you, for example, want to focus on um, reading and writing in, the, in our experience on the basis of the research that we've done, the notion of narrative is actually quite useful and quite important and allows you to do lots of exciting things. And on my uh, delicious account, if you want to go there, I think you'll find 40 or so different resources tagged in relation to digital storytelling. So that's a very vibrant field. And there's a lot of uh, exciting tools out there that allow you to do this. But in order to be able to do it effectively, my argument would be you actually need to engage a little bit with what is known about the field of uh, narrative from a, um, a theoretical perspective. What do we know about writing processes in the foreign language and how can we feed all of this in uh, and map it onto or match it with 
the affordances of technology in order to give us any sort of chance uh, to become uh, uh, effective users of technology in those contexts. No idea whether that's what you expected to hear from me, but that's what I have to say in this, so I hope you're taking something away.